One of the biggest shakeups in Canadian political history took place in the 1990s when the Reform Party went from one seat to two and a half million votes and 52 seats in the 1993 election. The vision for that new, more populist, more Western Canada-focused party came from Preston Manning. Two months shy of his 79th birthday, Mr. Manning is still trying to improve Canadian democracy and has some ideas in his latest book, Do Something, 365 Ways You Can Strengthen Canada. And it brings the founder and first leader of the Reform Party back to our airwaves from, where are you, Mr. Manning? Are you in Edmonton or Calgary? I'm in Calgary. I'm in Calgary, Steve. You are in Calgary. Good to have you back on our program again. Well, thank you. Thank uh, you. I do want to start by, by pointing out that The Economist magazine does this Democracy Index survey every year, and apparently of all the countries in the whole world, Canada came out fifth best, which is not first best, but fifth is not bad. On the other hand, you write, democracy in Canada, defined as government of the people, by the people, and for the people, is in deep trouble. What are you seeing that The Economist isn't? Well, the, I guess one of the main things is just the disillusionment of Canadians, the, the disrespect of democratic processes, democratic institutions, uh, uh, politicians in general. I keep in touch with some of the pollsters, Steve, you know, that we used to work with in the political business, and I've kept asking them during this COVID crisis, is there a flicker of concern on the part of the public that the... Uh, that the parliament was virtually shut down, that some of the legislatures have been virtually shut down or have had meaningless sessions. And they say there's not a flicker of concern. <laughs> In fact, one of them said, I don't think the, part, the House of Commons could be shut down for two or three years, or it could be shut down for two or three years, and I don't think Canadians would even notice, let alone care. So I, I think there's a deeper problem, much deeper problem, what the economist picked up. What does that speak to, in your view? Well, to the po politicians and the political parties, and I've been involved with those all my life, I, I think we need to strengthen the, the, the knowledge and skills of the, uh, of the political practitioners and the trustworthiness of them. Uh, years ago, we did an, another a national survey asking people, Canadians, what, what's most important to you, that a, a candidate or an elected official be knowledgeable, that they know something about uh, this and that and the issues and so forth. Uh, that they have certain skills, communication skills, decision-making skills, representation skills, or, or that they have certain character traits, uh, honesty, integrity, trustworthiness. And uh, predictably, character trumped uh, knowledge and skills, uh, very, very much so. P people saying, I don't care how knowledgeable or how skillful a person is if I can't trust them because of certain character characteristics or a lack of them, then it doesn't, the rest doesn't matter. So I think there's a lot that has to be done to strengthen the character, the knowledge and the skills of political practitioners if you want to restore public confidence in, in our form of democracy. Where would you put that lack of confidence the public has in the system and in those it elects to do its business in terms of an explanation for why voter turnout has gone inexorably down over the last many decades? Well, I think you're you're putting your finger on one of the indications that people are are not participating in the processes because they don't think it it does any good, and so the, these factors that I'm talking about, strengthening the, the knowledge, skills, uh, the character of the political practitioners, is necessary to win back that confidence. When I left the parliament, Steve, I uh, that was. 2001, yeah, 2001, uh, a while back, I, I did a survey. I, I talked to the speakers and the clerks of the, the House of Commons, the 10 provincial legislatures, and a couple of the territorial assemblies. And, and I said to them, you've seen uh, uh, hundreds of elected people come through your assembly and, and often not prepared for the job uh, as well as they could be. What would you suggest in terms of courses or training that might raise the, the, the knowledge and skills and therefore the confidence of the people in the assembly? And they gave me this list of 30 things, all the way from protocol to uh, small office management to communications, incidentally, lawmaking. They said <laughs> nobody teaches them lawmaking, and these people are the only people that can make statute law. And I actually took that list to Carleton University, and Carleton developed this uh, Riddell uh, graduate program in political management to try to meet some of those uh, uh, training needs. I took it to UBC, and uh, uh, UBC developed this uh, Summer Institute for Future Legislators, and they're working on a democracy house that would be a, 
a 100-seat replica of the House of Commons where you could provide heavy-duty training to better prepare uh, people for elected office if that's what they seek to do. And I, I think that's one of the things could be done to, to strengthen the uh, political class so that people have more confidence in it. I noted that recommendation in your book with great interest because it's amazing, to, at least it's been amazing to me over the years, that people can be superstars in their chosen fields and yet leave that behind, go into politics where they know absolutely nothing about any, about how the whole political system works, and yet we do that over and over and over again. Why have we not figured this out yet? I, I, I don't know. Maybe we haven't talked about it enough, and that's what I'm trying to do in this uh, book. The, 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 the other thing that would help this, Steve, is, is the parties developing much stronger recruitment processes for recruiting people into public life in the first place. Uh, my wife, Sandra, and I have, we have 13 grandkids, uh, a third of them boys that play hockey, a couple of them at fairly high levels. And so we've been to an infinite number of uh, hockey games. And you go to these arenas, not during the COVID time, but before, uh, uh, you know, 6.30 in the morning. And they, if you look at the back row on the the seats, there, there's a couple of grizzled old guys with clipboards. Who are these grizzled old guys with clipboards watching 11 and 12 year olds play hockey? They're scouts. Hmm. Some of them are scouts with NHL connections, scouting 12 year olds to see if there's somebody that shows a talent that if you gave them more training, better opportunities, experience, maybe they could play the national game at the highest level. W where's our political equivalent to that? Who's out scouting the next generation to find young people with some of the character traits, skills, potentially, that could be cultivated and developed? I think we need that scouting capacity if we want to raise the, the qualifications of the political class. I wonder, though, whether you think politics has become so discredited and our democracy uh, lies in such disrepair at the moment that anybody who is, quote unquote, of quality will surely choose another profession to go into rather than politics. Are we there yet? Well, that, that's, that's very true. And I've been involved in candidate recruitment all my life, uh, provincially and, and then uh, federally. And uh, the biggest single reason given now, and, and I've heard this reason <laughs> expressed in the last six months, of why some quality person with a lot to give, if you could ever get them there, says, I, I won't touch it. And the main reason they give, and this touches a little bit on your business, uh, Steve, but they say, I will not put up with the abuse that I will get from the mass media and particularly from the social media. And more importantly, I will not submit my family to the abuse that you get today in the political arena, particularly in this polarized environment. And that's a very hard thing to counter. If, if somebody raises financial things, you can answer that. If they, they raise other concerns, you can usually answer that. But that, that one of just uh, uh, people finding the political uh, arena corrosive from a, a personal standpoint, the impacts on their family, it's, it's very hard to rebut that objection. Well, on the other hand, I have talked to politicians as well who say they acknowledge, of course, the, the family price one pays, the lack of privacy, the, the constant on social media attacks and so on. And I've heard some say, yeah, that happens, but it's a relatively small price to pay for having the opportunity to have your hands on the levers of the country's agenda or the province's agenda or whatever for a period of time. Is that deal no longer worth it anymore? Well, no, I think there are people that uh, that will say that, and then uh, they are not so disincentivized as to not throw their hat in the ring. But I hear far more of this other argument that I won't touch it because of the negative impacts on my family. Uh, I come from a political family. One of the ways of coping with all that abuse is develop a hard shell so that it, it doesn't get to you. You don't pay any attention. Now, there's a danger in that. Uh, my father had that sh shell, I had that shell. The danger in that is you develop such a hard shell that certain emotional messages and that that should get through to you don't get through. So even the defense mechanisms for coping with the <laughs> corrosive environment, if you're not careful, they can turn out to be uh, a liability as much as an asset. Just for those who don't know, your father was Premier of Alberta back in the day, and we just remind everybody of that. I, I would love you to humor me for just a second, because I want to put a theory to you and get your view on it. And this goes back to voter participation, which we talked about earlier in our interview. I know that you believe that a high voter turnout is a sign that a democracy is thriving and that people want to participate and are engaged. However, in the last U.S. presidential election, they had a record number of people participating and very much engaged. And 
I'm not sure it was an indication of how healthy and thriving democracy was. I think you could make an argument that people saw it as a sign that the apocalypse would be upon them if the other side won, and that's what brought them to the polls because they thought the potential for the country going through some kind of existential crisis is too high not to participate. Now, th that's a very different argument from voter engagement and voter participation of the same thing. Fair to say? Yes, but I think the factor there, Steve, is that if the high voter turnout is, is fed by this polarization, by people getting into absolute warring camps, and if I don't get out there, the other guy will win and he'll destroy the country. If that's what's motivating the uh, increase in voting, not, not citizen concern about uh, how to solve certain issues, not concern for advancing certain uh, high-minded values or, or, or positions, but uh, this product of extreme polarization and we can't let the other guys win. If that's what's driving the increased participation, then that's not good. Uh, so, and that's why I think this, the necessity of, of addressing this question of extreme polarization in the political arena is important, because in the end, it's a, it's a liability, not an asset, even if it does increase a voter turnout. Okay. Let's do a quote from your book here. This is from Do Something. The weakness and danger of state-supported identity politics as currently practiced by the Trudeau administration and others like-minded is that it divides the population and electorate into an increasing number of minority groups distinguished mainly by their differences rather than their commonalities. This makes the reconciliation of conflicting interests and the achievement of a national or provincial consensus on anything increasingly difficult to attain. Do you think identity politics is basically a natural phenomenon in a country as multicultural as Canada and therefore that's, it, it just comes with the territory. If you exploit the division, the point I'm trying to make there is if, if you exploit the divisions, if you uh, uh, increasingly say it's extremely important to know what your race is, what your gender is, what your cultural background is, what your religious orientation, what's your sexual orientation, and depending on what you say to me, then we'll, we'll give certain rights to you or certain privileges to you or do certain things for you uh, based on those criteria. I think in the end of the day, that is divisive. And what the approach I would prefer to take is we're all human beings. What are the things we have in common? And, and what are the things we can therefore advance as entitlements to you, regardless of your race or your culture, your gender, your sexual orientation, rather than because of them? And uh, I think this identity, this country can't take its, uh, you know this very well, and I, I know it. I was in the parliament the worst night in my time in parliament was the night of that Quebec referendum when the country came within a hair uh, of breaking up. Th this country cannot take national unity for granted. It's got to, in my view, build on the things people have in common rather than on these distinctives such as race, culture, gender, and so forth. The, the, the other area in this, it, it, we mentioned national unity. Half of the national unity problems in this country, in my view, come out of the tension between the federal and provincial governments. And if there's one thing that could be done to change that, and I, I've not been a big advocate of constitutional amendments because they're so hard to achieve, but one thing that would help that is a constitutional amendment forbidding the federal government from treaty making, legislating, spending or taxing in areas of provincial jurisdiction, such as natural resources, or joint jurisdiction, such as health and the environment, unless it gets the consent of the province affected. I think that would do away with 50% of the federal provincial uh, tensions and therefore would help unify the country rather than divide it. Well, of course, they just had a fight about that on the carbon tax and they went to the <laughs> Supreme Court and the Supreme Court doesn't agree with you, Mr. Manning. They went with the feds on that one. No, no, because there isn't that. If that constitutional amendment that I was talking about was there, the Supreme Court would have had no alternative but to say, yes, the federal government can do what it wants, but it's got to get the consent of the people it affects. I see. I see. Okay. Well, listen, as long as we're on the issue of the environment, I'm, I'm interested. You're, you're, um, you're a conservative. I think we could say that. You're a conservative. You define your conservatism perhaps a little differently from other conservatives in the country, but you're a conservative. And you have said, since we live in an ever-changing world, both democracy and conservatism need to be periodically realigned in order to adapt to different conditions. And I guess at the risk of um, sort of going over some ancient history here, do you think the former federal progressive conservative party 
which of course you help bring to an end. Do you think they missed the boat on that? Well, I, th I think so, and that, that's what caused the phenomena that, uh, you know, the Reform Party came about mainly as a result of disillusionment with both federal parties in, in the uh, uh, 1990s, and then we built these coalitions. The Reform built this coalition with the Klein Conservatives provincially, with the Filman Conservatives in Manitoba, with the Harris Conservatives in Ontario, created the Canadian Alliance, which was a bigger, broader conservative movement, and then Stephen Harper and Peter McKay took it the one step further, built a coalition between the alliance and what was left of the old Progressive Conservative Party and created the new Conservative Party of Canada. And uh, th that was done because the old Progressive Conservative Party couldn't adjust to the changing conditions. And, and I, I say, you don't, you don't want these political realignments every second Tuesday, but uh, I think every decade or so, you need those realignments. In fact, when the Reform Party was created, uh, the lawyer that helped put the Constitution together, I asked him to put a sunset clause in the Reform Party's Constitution. It would come to an end 10 years down the road unless it decided to renew itself or renew itself on some other foundation. And I don't think it would hurt for every federal party to have a sunset clause that forces it to rethink its foundations, say, every decade or maybe two decades. Huh. Does any other political party have that in its constitution? I, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so either. Okay. Let's, and again, I'm going to follow up on this notion of you as a conservative. Conservatives, you know, by, by the very nature of the word, they like to conserve. And you would think that there would be some natural environmentalists in a conservative movement that wanted to conserve the planet on which we live. But of course, I hearken back to the Conservative Party of Canada's most recent annual general meeting in which more than half the people who voted said they don't agree that climate change is for real. What, are, what do you clearly understand about a conservative wanting to conserve the environment and the planet that apparently those folks did not? Well, there are a couple of things there, Steve. First of all, there are all kinds of green conservatives. There are in the parliament. Michael Chong, uh, uh, this uh, Leslin Lewis. Uh, th there's a number of green conservatives, mainly among the younger crowd. So the idea that conservation and conservatism are incompatible, the words come from the same root. The, uh, with respect to that motion, this gets into the whole issue of science denial. And there's been some very interesting work done on that. There's this book, Enlightenment Now, by Steven uh, Pinker from uh, Harvard, that gets into that. And what he says, or he quotes some other experts on it, is that these people that deny certain things about science really haven't gone and studied the science and say, and you know, are denying it because they've studied it backwards and forwards. What they're denying is the political champions of that science, who they disagree with for a dozen different reasons that got nothing to do with the science. And that's what's at the root of that so-called science denial on the right, and it's also on the left. There, there's a dozens of scientific studies that show that the safest, most environmentally responsible way to move large volumes of petroleum long distances is by pipeline. It is not by trains mm -hmm. and it is not by trucks. But left-wing people often dis ignore that or even deny it. Why? Be because they've studied all these studies on pipeline? No, it's because to identify with it would put them in the same camp as the pipeline people or the conservatives, and they don't want to do that for a dozen reasons. It's got nothing to do with pipeline. So I, I think further explanations and understandings of the roots of this science denial left and right would be helpful in removing it as a factor from the, the political arena. Let me ask you as well about just where you think uh, this party, the Conservative Party of Canada, is these days. Uh, I think most small-D Democrats would agree that, that a country works best, a democracy works best, when it's got a competent, capable government in place and a competent, capable opposition ready to take over if that's what the people decide the next time out. Uh, the Conservative Party of Canada today, is it a competent, capable, ready-to-govern party in your view? Well, that's, as you know, in my book, that's the other half of my book, basically, is I think there's a whole bunch of things, not only that have to be done to strengthen democracy, but to strengthen conservatism's contributions within it. I, I use this model in the book of, a, of a, a pyramid, where I have the political parties, conservative or whatever, at the top of the, the, the pyramid, the elected people will actually represent whatever in an elected assembly. But uh, underneath it, I have all the components of what I would call as the conservative movement as distinct from the parties, the think tanks that generate intellectual capital, the training programs that train people, the communicators, the advocacy groups, the funders. 
And uh, I argue that the stronger that movement is underneath the political party, the stronger and more competent and prepared to govern the party will. So I'm spending a lot of time on uh, trying to strengthen the movement because I think that's the way that we strengthen the party. And that this is true for every party, not just for conservatives. Mm -hmm. In our last minute here, I do want to ask you about how concerned you are as we look at democracy writ large that, for example, the Chinese with their mm -hmm. state-driven so-called yeah. democracy, that yeah. maybe they're in ascension while our citizen-driven democracy may not be. What's your view on that? Well, that's a very, you could spend uh, two or three of your programs on that, Steve. In fact, I'd encourage you to do it. I think the greatest ideological competition of the 21st century is going to be between citizen-directed democracy as practiced however imperfectly in the West versus that state-directed democracy as promoted and believed in by the Communist Party and government of China. And if we're honest, I think we have to say we're losing that battle. Uh, I talked to diplomats I, when I was in the political business in from Africa and S South America and asked them which of those models. And if they came from a country with somewhat of an authoritarian background, they would look at me and say, which one, when I'd say, which one do you prefer? They would say the Chinese model, of course. Mm. Does that break your heart? Uh, yes, yes. And, and again, just for me, it just strengthens this need that we have to strengthen our own ver version of democracy if we want to be competitive internationally, let alone better off domestically. Well, people can always go get the book, do something, and if they do, they will find 365 ways to strengthen Canada, uh, one for every day of the year. That's the former leader and founder of the Reform Party of Canada, Preston Manning. Mr. Manning, not only are we grateful for the time you spent with us here on TVO tonight, but let me say personally, I'm grateful every time you send me a very critical email about some column I've written, because I always appreciate hearing your point of view. So thank you. Well, let's keep it up, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> the Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.